Welcome to Vaccines for All conference, co-hosted by Trusted Pandemic Technologies at MIT, the Auto ID Lab, and uh, New America. I'm Ramesh Raskar, Associate Professor at uh, MIT Media Lab, and I'm delighted to welcome you and also introduce our co-organizers, Susan. Thanks to everyone who's joined us today for this discussion about vaccines and my appreciation to our terrific team of organizers for their innovative work. I'm Rear Admiral Susan Blumenthal, former Assistant Surgeon General of the United States. I serve as a visiting professor here at the MIT Media Lab and medical advisor to AMFAR and as director of the Health Innovations Lab at New America, a proud co-sponsor of this conference. New America is an action tank that is confronting the challenges created by rapid technological and social change and seizing the opportunities those changes create. The challenge, a tsunami of COVID-19 infections and deaths has occurred and a surge upon this surge is predicted for the weeks and the months ahead. Never before have we seen a virus that can be asymptomatic in 40% of people and yet kill hundreds of thousands of others. The pandemic has revealed multiple weaknesses in America's public health infrastructure that had been underfunded and woefully neglected for all too long. Additionally, a spotlight has been shown on the shameful health disparities for communities of color, frontline workers, and other vulnerable populations. How can technology modernize public health systems? This is a question posed by this conference today. Innovation combined with proven public health practices spells progress. But the fact is that until the coronavirus pandemic emerged, public health had not fully integrated technology and social media expertise as critical tools for addressing 21st century health challenges. But everything has changed as a result of this once in a generation public health threat that is accelerating multidisciplinary collaboration and action. Today, public health and technology experts are working together to develop a national pandemic preparedness and response innovation agenda for surveillance, testing, contact tracing, public health communications, telemedicine, vaccine and therapeutics development, as well as modernizing the supply chain for vital medical resources. And thankfully, as a result of unprecedented levels of government and private sector funding and the ingenuity of scientists worldwide, a new generation of vaccines, a life-saving tool, has rapidly become available to fight COVID-19. But now, how can we equitably deploy these tools? And, um, and how can we effectively measure their health outcomes and foster trust to combat the infodemic of misinformation so that people choose to get vaccinated. That is what this conference on Vaccines for All is all about. Thanks for everything each one of you is doing in this fight. And I wanna recognize my colleague, uh, Sharma, who is, uh, can't be with us this morning, but he will join us uh, later at noon. And uh, thanks again to all the organizers for their efforts. Good morning, I'm Shirley Bergen. Uh, for the last nine years, I've led the charge at TEDMED finding really important stories in health and medicine. I am a passionate advocate for communication and will be leading an important conversation at 10.45 this morning on communication and public trust. I want to thank everybody who has been an important part of pulling this event together. Communication is key. We need to come together and have conversations like this on a regular basis as this vaccine rolls out. So thank you again to everybody. I'm looking forward to today's programming. I'll turn it over to Chaji. Hi all, this is Chaji Thaliwal, goes by JD. I'm a MIT Sloan executive MBA student and also working as a deputy CIO for Los Angeles County where I'm managing the health department's technology systems. So though I got an opportunity to organize this conference as an MIT student, I think it's a great opportunity to hear insights from all the experts performing a county role also. Especially being a part of a largest county of the US, we are already working on enabling the vaccine management solutions as we speak. So timing couldn't be perfect for this conference. So I would like to thank, thank all the speakers for their time and the viewers for the participation. So with that, uh, we'll, we are ready to kick off. So Ramesh, over to you. Thank you, everyone. So let's talk about 
the main theme of this conference, which is digital tools to empower citizens and to deal with the last mile challenges. Next slide. The challenges for equitable vaccine distribution, we can see them kind of in many areas. You know, it's about logistics and reach, how we're going to prioritize the tiers of who gets vaccinated first and later on. Uh, various health outcome monitoring, how do we assess the effectiveness and safety over time and over different population? Uh, how do we maintain the engagement? You know, we have challenges with, you know, two dose adherence, for example, privacy, you know, the idea of vaccine passports is controversial, but is also critical. And maybe some of the, one of some of the biggest issues are vaccine hesitancy and mistrust. Next slide. So to overcome this, you know, some amazing systems are being deployed uh, by the government and state departments, such as vaccine administration management systems or vaccine adverse event reporting systems. Um, although there is some pushback, you know, those New York Times headline says, you know, some states are, are pushing back uh, after asking, CDC asking for personal data of those vaccinated, uh, or these systems can be manipulated. Uh, there could be a data breach, especially by foreign entities. So the question for us today is how can we take these great systems that are being built by public health and tweak it, modify it, or make our proposals you know, in a very solution-driven manner to see what we can do. Next slide. Now think about the vaccination record card, which can be used as a reminder or also as a verification, which is you know, a fantastic system uh, that will be used. But uh, the challenge with that is do it does reveal the personally identifiable information like name and birth date. It's open to some fraud and, and um, you know, misrepresentation and also data remains siloed. So can we make you know, some modifications to systems like this? Next slide. So for example, for the same vaccination record, we can remove the PII uh, and add a QR code, which is actually a digital signature that anybody can use to visit their own personalized page at CDC or enter the 16 digit character. And as you can see, no name or birth date is required. It can also be used for, for verification. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to solutions, you know, they can vary from broadcast media with public service announcement. There could be paper cards, vaccination cards that have digital signed QR codes on them. Uh, there could be web-based systems as the VAMS and VAR system is already partially doing. It could be smartphone apps through SMS alerts or maybe privacy preserving solutions uh, that can do all these things kind of, you know, as a Swiss army knife. Next slide. And we do have experience doing this. You know, my own lab spun off this foundation, PathCheck Foundation uh, out of MIT, and now it's an official exposure notification app in five US states and territories, such as Minnesota and Hawaii and Guam and so on. It's also the world's largest open source nonprofit for COVID-19. And I think the fact that exposure notification apps have played a role gives us some hope that similar privacy preserving app can be used in a decentralized manner as opposed to centralizing uh, all the information. So let me show you just a proposal of what this app could do. Next slide. Uh, let's play the video. And when it comes to this kind of apps, uh, you know, they could provide all these functionalities that we care about, um, make sure uh, privacy is preserved, uh, you know, create eligibility coupons uh, by codes given by our employers, uh, see the status in your in your county or in your zip code. Uh, have a vaccine diary. Um, after you enter the ten digit code, you can go for your first dose, but maybe you have to wait because you know you're you don't have the priority. Uh, schedule your appointments the same way you would do it. Uh, in a but you can do this in a privacy preserving way in an anonymous manner. Uh, you can record your first dose. Just open your camera and record your first dose with QR code. Uh, and then get a reminder. And after 27 days or 28 days, get the reminder to do uh, the second dose. Uh, and uh, after you're done the two doses, you know, you can use that uh, for, you know, a simple verification, but you still need to wait for 14 days for the immunity to, to kick in. Nevertheless, you can use this digitally signed, signed QR code uh, for your system. Um, and then you can stay engaged to see if there are any symptoms or adverse reaction you would like to report in an anonymous uh, manner uh, to the state government. Uh, and record your symptoms, keep a symptoms diary. And at some point, 
If you have questions, you know, uh, have the right messaging. Uh, uh, and at some point, you might want to upload your dosage and symptoms. So it's kind of a verified user who can upload uh, their symptom. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can, you know, you can continue to do the messaging and upload uh, this data. The key point of this uh, proposed app is that no personally identifiable information was used, uh, and it's very difficult to spoof the, uh, the anonymous information you would upload to the CDC or public health. Next slide. Uh, and the benefit of this private privacy preserving aggregation is that public health can still see this on a dashboard of first dose, second dose, unvaccinated, you know, uh, social media reactions, uh, and so on. Next slide. So to conclude, I think we are all here to talk about brainstorm various solutions. They can vary from broadcast to paper cards, to SMS, to apps. Uh, and we're here as part of Trusted Pandemic Tech program at MIT to work on open standards, architectures, release open source code, work on algorithms, and really focus on how we can decentralize uh, the vaccine administration process so that we can maintain privacy, efficiency, and equity, whether we use vaccination cards or apps. Thank you. And with that, let me hand it over to the executive director, MIT Media Lab, Professor Deb Roy. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Um, well, I'm gonna be wearing two hats today. Just first of all, wearing my executive director uh, uh, hat, I'd like to welcome all of you to this event. Um, the Media Lab, uh, as you know, one of the organizers of the event, I just wanted to say, embraces a interdisciplinary approach to research, um, which really I think is um, important here as we work on challenges that spill over disciplinary boundaries. Um, and we really have to uh, find ways to work together. Um, and uh, really our focus is on designing technologies that empower both individuals and communities. And there's really a wide range of research underway across the Media Lab, uh, some of which you'll, you'll hear about today. Um, I'm told there's over 300 people registered uh, for this event today. I want to thank in particular Shirley Bergen and Susan Blumenthal for reaching out to some of the incredible uh, uh, group of experts that we have um, convened today. And uh, as it's, it's my hope um, as, uh, as one of the uh, members of Media Lab that this event will be an opportunity for all of us to learn and get new ideas um, ideally spark new collaborations that lead uh, to concrete action because if ever there's been a time to collaborate um, and, uh, um, and, and lead to action, that, that time is now. And uh, together, I hope uh, we can uh, beat the virus. So um, Ramesh, uh, would you like me to continue now and give the, take off my yes, hat and yes, give the presentation? Yes, Great. Okay, so as a, uh, uh, the leader of a um, one of the research groups within the Media Lab, uh, um, I am involved with a project that I'd like to share with you now um, that we call Health Pulse. And uh, as you can see, there is a, a large number of collaborators, a very important one, Susan Blumenthal, who you just heard from earlier today. Um, and it was really a conversation between Susan and I that sparked um, very, uh, very rapidly um, our lab's involvement uh, in public health uh, related um, communication effort. Um, so very suddenly uh, back in early March um, from conversations with Susan um, and then with involvement and sort of support from McKinsey, we launched a social media campaign called Beat the Virus. And um, it literally began on a Sunday evening from S Susan Blumenthal's lips to Justin Bieber's ears, uh, a message that Bieber posted on Instagram and very quickly we were able to reach a large number of uh, celebrity social media influencers. We started experimenting with different formats to, to reach more targeted communities that were underexposed to public health messaging. Um, and uh, over a couple of months, we were able to um, uh, deliver over 650 million media impressions. And now that has transitioned to a information repository and hub uh, that Susan Blumenthal in New America, um, together with the Media Lab and others, are, are building. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what this has expanded into. You know, the larger challenge is that life-saving public health messages aren't being heard, trusted, and adopted 
in the US today. And so uh, we are developing uh, a local method, building on some of the social media analytics um, that we began with. And we're working specifically um, with partners in Atlanta, where the goal is to deliver relevant, trusted, and effective uh, public health messaging with a, a focus on uh, members of Black Atlanta community, south of I-20 in particular, uh, where um, we know that um, people have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, grounded in um, local uh, listening channels, which I want to just give you a, a sense very quickly of what that looks like. So with this, this goal of delivering actionable public health information, we begin by listening to uh, members of the community um, and distill patterns of concern and misinformation that we hear in the community to actually tailor and contextualize messaging, which is then shared through local influencers to communities in Atlanta. Um, and as we do that, create a feedback loop where we learn what's working and what's not and refine. So this is the basic picture of what we are implementing. Um, and I, I wanna just show you a couple of examples of how data science and media analytics are being used as tools to create a scalable and responsive version of this system. So first on the facilitated dialogue, like all conversations today, uh, we're doing it on Zoom along with uh, Miro, uh, we've uh, uh, virtual um, whiteboard. So we are convening small groups of members of various communities and we've developed a kind of uh, facilitated dialogue that in particular um, invites people to share hopes and concerns about the vaccine, share personal stories as they relate to their lived experience uh, with stakeholders related to uh, vaccines. Um, and then we have developed tools, and this is one I'll just let play, uh, which allows us to do speech analytics. So we can drill into COVID-19 automatically indexed speech recordings, go to specific conversations, look at automatic index terms like the pandemic, or government or vaccine, and then actually drill into the transcripts of the spoken dialogue to look at what is being said by various people in these, uh, these dialogues. I'm, I'm gonna play for you now uh, a one minute clip of one of the kinds of patterns. So what we're doing is extracting patterns of concern that we hear across multiple conversations. So this is just a one minute clip to give you the gist of the kind of data that uh, this process produces. As a woman of color in the United States, there's been stories of like a lot of medical measures or medical experiments that they kind of use like black women or like Latino women as like like the test rats. And my friend's family is like um, mostly poor and black and the older black family members uh, like asked by people who are doing um, clinical trials if they would like to be a part of the trials. A lot of times people are not like well informed and experiment may go awry or something there might be problems the concerns that kind of like stand out to me about the lack of that's what i meant by lack of appropriate testing for the vaccine it's probably gonna be tested on disadvantaged populations and there might be a, like people who die based off that just because we're trying to sprint through this um whole thing but they use they often use that population because they think oh no no one really care or it'll just no one will really care that they're ignorant or something so it can become a problem so once we have a pattern of concern from these facilitated dialogues, uh, we can actually cross check. So this is a second tool in our lab where we can search for vaccine trial as a phrase in local Atlanta talk radio stations. We're ingesting about 30 million words of talk radio every day. So we can do this kind of search to look for prevalence of similar concerns on radio and on Twitter. So here we can type in any natural language query like I don't trust the vaccine and find all the tweets emanating from the, the Atlanta local area that reinforce this concern. So to summarize, from facilitated dialogue, we establish different patterns of concerns. We cross check with much larger volumes of Twitter and uh, local radio. Um, that lets us weight the level of prevalence uh, uh, of concerns and misinformation. And then a second input we can use is to analyze the graph of Twitter users. We've identified about 175,000 users that are based in Atlanta and identify clusters based on affinity, such as uh, this Christian ministry, um, soccer fans, black culture, um, pop culture uh, clusters of users. 
And the, the social graph analysis gives us a second really valuable input. It lets us mine to see what kind of vernacular word choice um, is most appropriate for a focus group that we're trying to reach. So the word choice together with this kind of data-driven uh, mapping of the ebb and flow of concerns and misinformation lets us create a communication brief. There's a human in the loop here that creates this kind of brief and provides it to local influencers. We're reaching out to faith leaders, local athletes, um, and other uh, others that have already trusted uh, reach within their communities. And uh, we believe this, this system, as we're piling in Atlanta, uh, has very natural ways to scale because all the different data sources, of course, um, are, are, um, are digitally based and, um, and uh, we can roll out in other locations. So that is the Health Pulse project that I want to share with you. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the, the session later this, uh, this morning that'll pick up on this theme of uh, trust and communication. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. That's, uh, that's a fascinating view of how we should not be just listening to the social media, but we have a way to be solutions driven and, and analyze uh, some of the trust and communication issues for COVID-19. Uh, so next, I would like to introduce um, Dr. Anuradha Gupta, who is the Deputy CEO of Gavi, the Alliance for Vaccines. And, and Dr. Gupta has been at Gavi since 2015, uh, and she's really at the forefront of how to think about uh, empowering citizens uh, in this crisis. So Anuradha. Dear distinguished guests, it's really an honor and pleasure to speak at this MIT event to address a very topical subject of COVID-19 vaccines for all. Equitable access to vaccines has been at the core of the mission of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and it is a subject which lies very close to my heart as Deputy CEO of Gavi, the Alliance. Gavi was created at the end of the millennium in 2000 as a new bold experiment in global development, a unique public-private partnership which aimed to wed the scale offered by public institutions with efficiency and innovation of private sector so that we could expand access to life-saving vaccines in 73 poorest countries of the world where millions of children were dying at that time because of causes that could be so easily prevented. By pooling demand for vaccines in these 73 countries that together account for 60% of global birth cohort and making use of innovative financing mechanisms such as vaccine bonds to raise capital, Gavi has consistently exceeded its goals. It has helped immunize a whole generation, over 822 million children, and saved more than 14 million lives, are helping to reduce child mortality because of vaccine preventable diseases by an astounding 70%, besides generating billions of dollars in economic gains. Today, coverage of hip, rota, pneumococcal vaccines is higher in Gavi countries than in the rest of the world, an achievement that was unimaginable when Gavi was set up. We are now focused on leaving no one behind with immunization by 2030, which means we will bring a laser focus on reaching those 10 million zero dose children who have never received even a single shot of any life-saving vaccines. These are children who are markers of acute societal inequity uh, and actually reside in communities that suffer from multiple deprivations and not just immunization. Though only one in eight children is zero dose, 50% of child deaths happen among them, highlighting the urgency of reaching the zero dose. As we do this, we are determined to employ the best of what technology can offer 
from drones to biometrics so that we can further improve equity and immunization, save million more lives, prevent outbreaks before they can spread and help countries on the road to self-sufficiency. The COVID-19 pandemic is undoubtedly the biggest threat to health security in a lifetime. It has caused massive economic and social devastation with millions more getting pushed into deeper poverty. Secondary effects of COVID have been far more serious with 1 million more children estimated to die within a period of just six months. This must be stopped as quickly as possible. The non-pharmaceutical interventions such as washing hands, social distancing, wearing masks have contributed without doubt to slowing down the spread of the virus. But it is also clear from the recent resurgence that an efficacious and safe vaccine will be essential to end the acute phase of the pandemic. The world is immensely proud of the researchers and scientists who have worked day and night to bring forward promising COVID-19 vaccines at an incredible speed. But the development of safe and efficacious vaccine is only the first step in a highly complex process. Demand for a COVID-19 vaccine will outstrip anything the pharmaceutical industry has ever seen and the hurdles of manufacturing, procuring, distributing, and deploying COVID-19 vaccines on an unprecedented scale need to be addressed now with the same degree of urgency and seriousness. The important question is, how do we ensure equitable access? The shortage of the H1N1 vaccine in 2009 or the recent shortage of protective uh, equipment is a vivid reminder that inequity and delays can have deadly consequences. Before Gavi's market shaping efforts, lower income countries receive new vaccines on an average of seven years interval later than wealthier ones. The world cannot afford to follow this path for COVID-19 vaccines. A recent study from Northeastern University makes clear the consequences of rich countries. If, if they monopolize COVID-19 vaccines, it could cause twice as many deaths as distributing them equally. In today's interconnected world, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Viruses do not respect borders. So it is therefore in the interest of the world and of rich countries themselves that all countries, including our poor countries, get equal access and fair access to this uh, vaccine. For this purpose, Gavi has been instrumental in bringing forward the concept of the COVAX facility a global procurement mechanism for COVID-19 vaccines. The COVAX facility is pooling demand and purchasing power of 189 economies to make investments across a broad portfolio of promising vaccine candidates so that ad scale manufacturing happens expeditiously and rapid access to safe and efficacious vaccines is enabled as soon as they receive Regu regulatory approval. Guided by an allocation framework being developed by WHO, the COVAX facility will then equitably distribute these doses to help health workers and at risk groups in all participating economies. Within the COVAX facility, GAV is coordinating the development and implementation of the COVAX AMC, the financing instrument that will support a procurement and supply of COVID-19 vaccines for 92 lower middle and low income economies which do not have the required fiscal space. The COVAX AMC ensures that disparities in national income levels do not inhibit the goal of equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. The COVAX AMC will build 
on Gavi's two decades of experience of mobilizing resources to deliver life-saving vaccines to more than half of the world's population, including the hardest to reach uh, communities. What is so unique about COVAX is that vaccines will be made available to people in all participating economy, economies, rich or poor, at the same time, with almost 1 billion of these doses made available to people in the 92 poorest ones uh, through the AMC. Never before has a life-saving health intervention against such a global health threat been made available to people in the global north and south simultaneously at such speed. When the moment comes, this will be the single largest and most rapid global vaccine deployment we have ever seen. Kicking off the AMC, however, requires a seed funding of at least uh, $2 billion by the end of 2020, with an additional $5 billion needed by 2021. The funding will be spent largely on the procurement of vaccines, but also on logistics and technical support required for this successful rollout. So far, we have raised over $2 billion of a 7 billion target for 2021, which represents approximately 25% of what we need in total. We urgently need to raise an additional 5 billion by the end of the year to ensure equitable distribution of these vaccines to those who need them. The other paramount question is how to deliver COVID-19 vaccines unprecedented scale and speed in countries that suffer from weak health systems. Effective delivery of these vaccines would require careful cataloging of priority groups, augmentation of cold chain, including provision of ultra cold chain in some cases, training of health workers in new protocols, and building of public trust in COVID-19 vaccines. In an atmosphere of growing misinformation and rumors, and effective monitoring and, and surveillance. It is against this backdrop that I would like to talk about how digital technology can play a role in ensuring that vaccine is available and delivered to all. In many Gavi supported countries, we have observed that barriers to technology access have fallen dramatically, as symbolized by the growing penetration of mobile phones and smartphones. At the same time, there has been a widening gap between the availability of digital tools and the slow uptake and integration into health systems. We have often asked at Gavi how we can create a platform to source and scale innovative solutions. The goal is to leverage digital technology to leapfrog current systems and to reach those who really at the highest risk of dying from diseases. Recognizing that innovative solutions often come from startups, we launched in 2016 a very exciting initiative called INFUSE, which stands for Innovation for Uptake, Scale, and Equity in Immunization. INFUSE helps improve vaccine delivery systems by connecting high-impact proven innovations with countries that, that need them most. Let me share an example of what we have been able to achieve with Infuse. A frequent problem in the vaccine supply chain, as you might be aware, is the lack of real-time data to manage storage and delivery of vaccine. We have therefore partnered with the pace setter Logistimo to strengthen supply chain to connect remote communities with reliable access to vaccines. Logistimo's Technology helps health workers manage vaccine inventories, avoid expiry in stockouts, and through the use of predictive analytics, orchestrate optimal decisions across the supply chain. The focus is on empowering last mile health workers by simplifying tracking and reporting, all while contributing to a broader web of real time data that helps providers make better decisions. Logistimo currently runs Gavi-sponsored projects in Angola and Senegal and provides technology 
for two other projects in India and Indonesia. We are hopeful that this solution could be also applicable to the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. Let's now take a look at a very short but interesting video. La gestion des stocks est un critère très important de la gestion efficace des vaccins, mais nous notons que les outils traditionnellement utilisés, tels que les registres de stock ou les bons de commande manuels, ne permettent pas d'avoir une situation à temps réel des stocks. Ils ne permettent pas de collecter l'information ou de la traiter, que ce soit l'information sur les stocks ou l'information sur les approvisionnements. À l'arrivée du logistiquement, donc on note une, une, une véritable amélioration par rapport aux, aux gestions des stocks des vaccins et des consommables. So you just uh, watched uh, this interesting uh, video, but I would want to emphasize that even the most innovative solution is bound to fail if it is not adapted to local context and needs or is not understood and owned by communities. Technology is essential, but not enough by itself. Therefore, we assess the value of digital innovations from the lens of three Vs that have to come together to make immunization possible. These three Vs are the vaccine, the vaccinator, and the vaccinee. Without any one of these three Vs, vaccination does not happen. On vaccine, Gavi has a team that looks into how innovation around vaccine-related technologies has the potential to transform immunization reach and its delivery. These include heat-stable vaccines, microarray patches, and barcoding. On vaccinator, uh, using mobile learning, we empower vaccinators through comprehensive training to strengthen the efforts of frontline health workers engaged in routine immunization. This has been particularly effective during the pandemic, where lockdowns and physical distancing measures require new ways of preparing frontline health workers with digital tools without relying on in-person instruction. On vaccines, we work with caregivers to sensitize them about the importance of vaccination and develop novel ways of reaching populations. Only half of children under five in sub-Saharan Africa are currently registered at birth, leaving many without an official identity. This makes it difficult for health practitioners to ensure these inf infants are identified, reached, and get the vaccines that they need at the right time. We therefore work with ID2020, whose representative is also with us today, uh, to leverage biometric technology, such as fingerprint matching or facial recognition to uniquely identify children. This allows us to link children with accurate and complete immunization record which could be then used for other health or education interventions. We have also seen that people often lose vaccination cards, making it difficult for caregivers to keep track of vaccination schedules. In response, we developed a solution with a private sector partner that automatically reminds caregivers of the next vaccination to SMS-based on electronic immunization registry. 
While the COVID-19 vaccine is at the forefront of our minds today, I cannot stress enough the importance of continuing innovative engagement with vaccinators and vaccinees. For the last mile health delivery to succeed, we must include vaccinators and vaccinees in program design, and they must be empowered to own the solution, as I said earlier. As I've described, we already have effective technology solutions. The question now is how to transpose them to the COVID-19 response and rapidly scale them up. For us to harness the power of technology for real impact, we need to be agile and quick, but also collaborative and inclusive. Together, we'll be able to put an end to the COVID-19 pandemic and continue protecting the world from vaccine preventable diseases. Finally, I want to emphasize the need for us to work with the private sector, leveraging the expertise, energy, and ingenuity that drives vaccine development, provides innovative solutions to health system challenges. We also rely on the financial resources of the private sector to support the low-income countries to quickly respond to the pandemic and bring business back to normal. Gavi has a matching fund which can match contributions from corporations and their employees, foundations, and other organizations. The value of private sector financing is measured by us, not only by the volume of funding provided, but by the speed with which it can be made available and by its catalytic nature and value. And time is of the essence for us. This crisis illustrates the necessity of global cooperation and the value of public and private partnership. No single country will be able to declare victory over COVID-19 until we have a workable pathway to control it everywhere. No one organization or company can tackle all the challenges we currently face ahead of us. I'm deeply proud that Gavi as an alliance and with its partners have proved that this type of collaboration is still possible. I would like to thank Professor Ramesh Rasker and the MIT Media Lab for this opportunity. And please feel free to reach out to us if you have the right ideas, technology solutions, or the financial resources to support countries in fighting this global pandemic. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Anuradha, and I do hope that social entrepreneurs uh, listening will, will heed your call to uh, kind of pivot and think about this challenge. Uh, thank you again. Uh, let me invite uh, Mr. Lava Agrawal, who's the Joint Secretary for Health Ministry of India, and you probably see him all the time uh, being at the forefront of this pandemic in India and also at international stages. Lava Agrawal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramesh, uh, Professor Dave Roy from MIT, Professor Lawrence, Mrs. Anuradha Gupta, Deputy CEO Gavi, all of the participants, ladies and gentlemen. I'm actually very happy to be part of this conference today on a very crucial discourse, Vaccine for All, COVID-19, Digital Tools to Empower Citizens. With December on the calendar, we as global community have been engaged in a prolonged battle against COVID-19 pandemic for the better part of the year. While lives have been lost, but we have also seen resilience, hope, and selflessness amongst people, organizations, and nations. India represents a major proportion of the world population as well as disease burden, and hence our challenges during management of this pandemic were also unique, and our response to that extent had to be curated, keeping in mind its vast population, diversity, and the federal government structure. Since the onset of pandemic, India had followed a proactive, preemptive, graded, whole of government and whole of society approach for the pandemic. These included surveillance at point of entry and in community, ensuring adequate testing, health infrastructure upgradation, ensuring logistics like oxygen, personal protection equipment, and unidentified masks, etc., capacity augmentation for healthcare work staff, and effective risk communication. We initiated our response much ahead of other countries in the world in terms of the fact that we had our first joint monitoring group under the Director General of Health Services sitting as the 8th of January. 
despite various constraints, effective planning, strategic management, and a robust institutional mechanism has enabled India to keep its cases and deaths per million one of the lowest among the most affected countries in the developed world. India has a cases per million of 7,068 and deaths per million of 103, which is one seventh and one ninth of the US respectively. With strong focus on clinical management and monitoring comorbidity, our fatality rate today stands at 1.45% with a global average of 2.25% that is much below the global average. Government had constituted a group of ministers under Honorable Health Minister for continuous engagement with states and this also provided necessary guidance under the overall supervision of our Honorable Prime Minister. As we are inching closer toward the final stages of vaccine availability and diversity daily, ensuring success in this area would be another mammoth task. India's world-class research institutes are presently at the forefront of our endeavor towards vaccine research and large-scale production. At present, out of 260 vaccine candidates in different stages of development globally, nine potential vaccines, including three indigenous ones as well, are scheduled to be manufactured in India, of which three are in pre-clinical stage and six are in various stages of clinical trial. With the help of India's apex regulator, the Drug Controller of India and Indian Council of Medical Research, we are sure, uh, ensuring that there is no compromise on scientific and regulatory norms, stretching from safety to efficacy while vaccines are given emergency use authorization. There is a vaccine task force and national expert group on vaccine administration for COVID-19 to provide technical guidance on procurement, identification of priority population groups, and they have accordingly prioritized healthcare workers and frontline workers to be covered in the initial phase besides people above 50 years of age as priority age group. India has always prided itself for its pharmaceutical and vaccination manufacturing industry. We have also been called the pharmacy to the world. Under our universal immunization program, India already takes approximately 12 million immunization sessions per year, covering 29 million pregnant women and 26 million infants. We already have an IT platform to manage logistics of vaccine supply chain and the cold chain management electronically through our 28,000 cold chain points. However, COVID-19 vaccinations will require India to scale up its overall infrastructure and digital management capacity. We are accordingly ensuring additional logistic requirements so as to have minimal impact parallelly on our existing healthcare services, especially national programs, and primary care, including routine immunization. We will require flexible technology solutions across the entire gamut of vaccine inventory management, temperature monitoring, and tracking up to beneficiary levels for multiple of millions of doses of vaccines around the country. These technology solutions are required to ensure effective transparency in distribution and need to have inclusivity and equitable access as part of its management. Throughout our COVID response, India has focused on incorporating digital interventions as part of our management strategy. From Arugya Setu, which has been already downloaded 166 million times across the country and is the most downloadable app in the world presently for self-evaluation, we have utilized Itihar, which is leveraging the call data records of all the people who are part of Arugya Setu application for detecting evolving clusters of cases. Indian Council of Medical Research Portal and COVID-19 India Portal, supported by application mobile apps such as RT-PCR and facility apps, serves as a repository of free data and enables us to take data-driven decisions and plan our intervention. Dear colleagues, when we shift our focus now to enhance service delivery of COVID vaccine, I am happy to highlight that India has developed a real-time digital platform for COVID-19 vaccination delivery or COVID, that is COVID winning over COVID. This platform will account for different cold storage requirements of multiple types of vaccines, two or more doses available, and certification for vaccine recipients. It enables end-to-end -end beneficiary management, 
allow citizens to self-register and monitor their vaccination schedules. It also provides SMS in 14 different Indian languages to citizens across the various parts of their vaccine distribution processes. It also has a mobile app for each and every vaccinator in the country through which the digital logging in of the vaccination process during the site will take place. Besides this, there is a proper digital tool to create vaccine sessions as per the priority criteria. And in the end, as has been mentioned by other people also, there is a QR code based Let's uh, let's bring uh, Love back uh, when he's online. Um, so let me introduce uh, uh, Susan Blumenthal, who's going to introduce our next two speakers. Thanks so much, Ramesh. Um, well, many legal and ethical issues have arisen surrounding mass COVID-19 vaccination, including ensuring equitable vaccine distribution, how to protect patient privacy, whether vaccination should be mandatory and certification methods for proving a person's vaccination history. To discuss these important issues with us, I'm delighted to introduce a renowned international scholar, Professor Larry Gostin. He serves as director of both the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law at Georgetown University and the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center on Public Health Law and Human Rights. Uh, Larry, we're so pleased to have you with us. Um, thank you very much, Susan. Um, I'm uh, really delighted to be here with you and um, to join MIT in this uh, really uh, seminal conference. Um, I've only got seven minutes and I've got a whole lot to cover. So forgive me, I thought the best way to organize my talk in, in seven minutes covering a lot of different topics is to do it sequ sequentially. Um, the uh, important thing here is that yesterday, uh, the US Food and Drug Administration's advisory panel voted in an historic vote um, uh, recommending that the US FDA uh, approve a, the first COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which is a messenger RNA vaccine devised by Pfizer and BioNTech. Um, this is a, a vaccine that's been shown to be highly effective at, 80, at 95% um, efficacy um, and is really a remarkable um, day in American life. Uh, we, are, we now have three stringent uh, regulators around the world, uh, the UK, soon the US and Canada um, that have uh, given emergency use, use authorization uh, for uh, this Pfizer vaccine. Um, so I think we do have to, you know, give credit where it's due. Um, Operation Warp Speed through the, the research and development phase um, was successful. Um, and in addition, I just want to recognize and say how proud I am of, of the US FDA. It's been under enormous uh, political pressure, um, which is, in my view, the worst of America. But our public health institutions and our science is the best of America. And uh, the FDA um, uh, is an institution that bended during this pandemic, if you think about uh, hydroxychloroquine and other events, but they never broke. And the level of transparency and rigor with which they um, uh, granted an EU, EUA for this vaccine um, is really truly commendable. The next stage, of course, will be in the months to come um, to get a, a full biologics license when the product is shown to be um, both safe, effective, and pure. Um, so it turns out that we, we probably have a really good vaccine, but it's only the very beginning. Um, the hard work is still to come. Um, and let me take you through the sequential part of this. Um, the first is, is that we, we're going to have vaccine scarcity and we're going to have significant scarcity over the next several months and possibly well into the summer. That being the case, we're going to have to have um, ethical priorities for who gets the vaccine first. For this, um, the CDC um, through uh, the National Vaccine Advisory um, a Committee is going to be making recommendations and has begun to make recommendations 
about the uh, equitable distribution. I think quite appropriately, um, uh, they've recommended that health workers uh, are first in line along with uh, residential uh, long-term care um, facilities um, for the elderly. Um, these are two vulnerable um, spots. I also see people with um, uh, serious uh, comorbidities uh, and age uh, being uh, prioritized. You know, I wrote a, an article for JAMA about whether or not um, we should prioritize socially disadvantaged uh, and economically disadvantaged. I believe we should. Um, there's also, I think, a strong case for um, a prioritizing um, Black Americans and other ethnic and um, racial minorities who've suffered um, four times the rate of COVID hospitalizations and deaths as the rest of us. Uh, and so uh, these are all really important priorities. These priorities, however, will be um, uh, set in real time and implemented through state, local, and tribal uh, health departments. Um, and that's where most of the action is going to take. We're going to need massive funding um, for uh, these health agencies um, to roll out the vaccine because they face enormous um, problems of delivery. Um, this is going to be one of the most uh, immense, if not the most immense, modern um, vaccination campaign of our lifetimes, um, following on, I think, from two other major campaigns, which was the polio um, uh, immunization campaign, and of course, the smallpox eradication campaign and the current um, polio eradication campaign. This is going to be particularly challenging um, because the early um, uh, messenger RNA vaccines, um, particularly the Pfizer one, requires deep, deep sto cold storage of minus 70, 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, the Moderna one about uh, 20 degrees minus um, Celsius. Um, and the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, which can be delivered through normal cold storage um, that all childhood vaccination systems around the world have um, is running into difficulties, certainly difficulties with the US regulator and, and perhaps difficulties um, uh, throughout. Um, and I can go into that later um, if that's uh, helpful. This is also a two dose vaccine. So we're going to have to keep track of who's had which dose and to get it uh, into people's arms. There's enormous amount of vaccine hesitancy in the United States estimated at between 50 to 60 percent of the population um, uh, that say that they would get the vaccine, um, which leads a large reservoir of people who are hesitant. So we're going to need um, a, a clear plan of vaccination uh, communication and literacy plan. We're going to need funding for uh, logistics um, to get uh, state and local health departments uh, the uh, uh, the money and the and the infrastructure that they need to actually deliver this vaccine. Um, I also want to mention um, the digital side of this because, in order to actually um, uh, function and deliver all these vaccines, and trace who's got the who's got the vaccine, who's next in line, who gets the second dose, we're going to need fairly sophisticated data systems. Uh, and probably national data systems since people move from, from state to state. There's been an extraordinarily um, a high level of concern about privacy implications of these data systems that we, I think we need to think about a lot. The first question is, you know, does the federal government um, need these, uh, need identifiable data or can it be used uh, or can they, they cope with unique identifiers or other um, uh, aggregate data. Um, this uh, is kind of playing out what happened in the early days of the AIDS pandemic about um, uh, 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 named reporting um, of uh, persons living with uh, HIV AIDS, um, particularly uh, named reporting for HIV um, positive test, test results. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to create firewalls to me, um, the public good of good data systems um, is a very important consideration um, and that we need these data systems to make sure that all of us stay 
healthy and safe and particularly poor rural disadvantaged uh, communities that, that they get the vaccines that they need. But we need firewalls to make sure that these are not used for immigration, law enforcement, employment, um, or in any way that might embarrass the individual. Um, public health agencies have very good track records on keeping um, data private and secure, um, but we need to make sure that there are legislative um, guarantees of privacy and that will boost public trust. Uh, I wanna have just two more quick things I want to say. There's been a lot of discussion about once we get you know, full um, biologics license for this vaccine, um, might we mandate it? Um, states legally could mandate it, probably ethically could, but the question is, is whether or not it would create a backlash. Um, currently in the United States, um, all 50 states require childhood vaccinations. Only one requires an adult vaccination, and that was only this year when Massachusetts, fearing a dual epidemic of influenza and COVID-19, mandated the influenza um, vaccine. Supreme Court has said it was lawful. The question is, is whether it would be effective or whether it would actually um, uh, make people more distrustful. At the moment, I don't think um, we should be considering mandating uh, COVID-19 vaccines. I can foresee, however, that there may be um, uh, employers, universities, and others that might mandate the vaccine as a condition of work to get our, our economy up safely running. The EEOC has said that this was lawful in relation to influenza vaccines, um, as long as there was a religious and disability exemption. They're currently considering the same kind of reasoning for COVID-19. I kind of expect them to come to the same kinds of conclusions, but employers are gonna to have to make smart choices to keep their empl fellow employees safe um, and their customers safe, um, and to do so maintaining confidence of uh, the uh, public. Um, I was part of a, um, uh, a research group that did a uh, global survey of vaccine hesitancy. And there was a certain amount of, of, of lack of trust, both in governments mandating vaccines and in employers. So we're gonna to have to navigate this well. I'm gonna end by uh, talking about something that's really important to this conference, but hasn't been really talked about much in America. We've talked about equity in the United States, but it's really important to talk about global equity. Every human being on this planet has an equal worth has an equal chance, a fair chance uh, to be healthy. It would be catastrophic from an ethical point of view if uh, we had a two-speed world um, where Europe and North America, parts of Asia um, were up, their economies were up and running, their people were safe, but people in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the Indian subcontinent, uh, Latin America were um, left behind, um, their economies sagging, uh, their political systems weak, um, their people dying. Um, this is going to be not just the greatest question of e equity in our lifetimes, but it's also an important matter for national security and also for national prosperity. Because as long as uh, we, we cannot be safe unless people are safe everywhere, clusters of cases will recede here uh, we need robust trading partners. We, we need robust diplomatic and political partners. It's sad to say the United States so far has not participated in the COVAX facility. I fully expect the Biden administration to do that, would recommend that they do it. We've seen a lot of vaccine nationalism, including from the US, UK, Europe, Canada, um, and other countries. Uh, we need to make um, vaccines a fully affordable and a global public good so that we waive intellectual property rights during this pandemic. And we grant licenses for companies in India um, uh, uh, and uh, other uh, uh, engines, pharmaceutical engines in low and middle income countries to actually get this vaccine out in enough doses um, with enough vaccine infrastructure that we can vaccinate the world. This is the greatest um, moral challenge of our generation. 
um, and we're in the grips of a pandemic. There's so much we can do. We can see an amazing uh, vaccine. Uh, we started a year ago with the most awesome force of human nature, a tiny microscopic um, uh, organism that literally gripped the world and controlled every person on the planet within weeks or months. A year later, we have an equal force of uh, humanity, which is the force of science. Um, but we need to use that force of science um, with compassion, um, with equity, and with justice. And with that, um, we can come together and really show the world that we're together in this, all of us, the rich, the poor, wherever we live. Um, thank you very much um, for the privilege of being here with you. Um, and I'll turn it over back to you, Susan, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, for that extremely uh, important talk uh, for raising uh, so many of the legal, ethical, and moral considerations of vaccine. Um, and, you know, talking about how we are all connected, we're all interdependent uh, against this invisible enemy. Um, and also with the celebration of science, the steps forward in, in, to ensure equitable and just um, deployment of this life-saving tool. Well, now to build on this discussion and to discuss with us the urgent need for global coordination, equity, and innovation in COVID-19 vaccination efforts, I am very honored to introduce our next plenary speaker, Dr. Victor Zhao, the distinguished president of the National Academy of Medicine, who also serves as the vice chair of the National Research Council. Dr. Zhao previously served as the chancellor of Duke University, as well as the president and CEO of the Duke University Health System. He is an internationally acclaimed leader and scientist whose pioneering innovative work has significantly improved healthcare in the United States and around the world. Dr. Zhao, welcome. Thank you very much, Susan, for inviting me. And it's great to follow my friend, Larry Gosten. He's actually set the stage for a lot of my talk, which will actually talk about how the world is coming together in terms of vaccine development and uh, equitable access. May I have the first slide, please? So I think by now, everybody knows, next slide. Next slide, please. By, well, by now, everybody knows about the Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca. Suffice to say that yesterday, the advisory panel of FDA recommended emergency authorization for the Pfizer vaccine. And of course, next week, we'll hear the Moderna vaccine. You know, as been said by others, this is really, I think, evidence for the impressive development of science and the science impact and where we're doing. If you look at the lower right corner of the slide, the Pfizer vaccine, from 69 days from knowing the viral sequence in January to first starting phase one, 15 weeks to finish phase one, 11 weeks to finish phase two, 300 days to finish phase three, and 10 months altogether from concept to result. It's really, really impressive. And the first time ever that an mRNA vaccine reached clinical application. Left side shows you all the amaz amazing platforms, which I will not have time to go into. Suffice to say, there are now 214 candidates, 13 in phase three, 11 in phase two. Next slide. So I think as Larry said, credit has to go to US in the way it's looking, organizing the whole issue of vaccine end to end, starting from research all the way to eventual procurement. And now of course we're into allocation delivery. Active run by NIH is a public private partnership that includes in fact industry and warp speed will include these components, particularly using BADA as an interface with private industry to uh, make many of the deals that you hear today. What I think is impressive is not only this is a good, well-organized machinery, but in fact, uh, it has spent event initially $10 billion by Congress, but now by now probably $18 billion. I want to emphasize that because as we talk about global equity, there's no such machinery in the, in the world that's like the US. 
and U.S. is an island. And for the rest of the world, the countries don't have the capability, don't have the dollars and firepower to do this. Therefore, we have to do it all together. Next slide. So early in the outbreak, by March, the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, on which I serve, we call for $8 billion to say, to support vaccines, drugs, diagnostic, you have to at least raise $8 billion. And we're fortunate, my, my good friend, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of EC, hosted a global pledging event that raised $18 billion. But even then, you see here, is not enough. Around the same time in April, uh, people came together to say the only way we can conquer this by accelerating the tools, but also achieving equity is to create uh, a coalition, if you will, collaboration of all the players in this field. Because to date, everybody plays separately, but the world is not gonna be able to address this without coming together. Given the fact, as you heard from Anna Ruda, that there are many poor countries and also middle income countries and others that none of them will have the research capacity or the finances to make the many deals. Next slide. So what happened is that unprecedented volunteering of coming together of CEPI, which is the organization which I served on the board that in fact is into vaccine and uh, development and the research. To Gavi, you heard from Dr. Gupta that is looking at procurement for the poor countries, to WHO, to Global Fund that looks at HIV, TB, malaria, find World Bank Unity, all coming together voluntarily. And I was very fortunate to be involved with this very early discussion and formation of what is known now as Act Accelerator. Next slide. Act Accelerator today is a, shall we say, a lightly uh, governed organization because nobody wants to create another multinational agency. But what's successful is bringing together the many groups to address vaccine, therapeutics, and diagnostic, as you see in this slide, the three pillars, and also health system connector. Like the council oversees this, which is made of uh, WHO, European Commission, some G20 countries, and Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, and others. And it's coordinated by a coordinating hub overseen by the principals or steering group, which I serve. I think it's important, if you look at this slide, the left side that says, really, the purpose is to do end-to-end. -end. So no longer are we separately looking at research or manufacturing or procurement, but coming together, all together, to find ways to move all those from one end to the other for vaccine therapeutics and diagnostics. Next slide. So the goal of uh, Act Accelerator is to have 2 billion doses by then 2021, because we're certainly thinking about how can we reach every single country, rich or poor, and 245 million doses by, of therapeutics by mid 2021, and of course 500 million tests by mid-2021 in diagnostics. I don't have time to go over this, but you know it's only been existing for seven months, but we work every single week between the weeks of people who run different organizations, as I said, CEPI, Global Fund, WHO, but together try to solve the problem whereby you can identify the promising vaccines, design the clinical trials, being able to actually get into relationship with companies to actually do risk manufacturing to get into procuring doses and then ultimately allocation and distribution. Next slide. So this is great. So therefore a lot of vaccine candidates I already talked about and also dexamethasone, the therapeutics that came out from the trials and others. But as uh, Anna Gupta said, said, there's a real problem because there's vaccine nationalism you know, about 10% of the world's population of rich countries control, cornered well over 60% of all the vaccines, if not more. So even the smaller uh, rich countries, like UK, Japan, 
Singapore, et cetera, Singapore population of 5.28 million, don't have the resources to be like United States. And as Larry said, United States has stayed out of this, which I believe is a big mistake. But however, people have come together and the vaccine pillar called COVAX, as you heard from Dr. Gupta, has brought together self-financing countries, those countries who can't be like United States, but they've come together, Norway, UK, Germany, Japan, you name it. So that's 92 economies for the poor countries and through Gavi, and some 90 some economies now, as she said, 189 economies from South Korea, that includes middle income countries, rich income countries, to get as, to pool its ability to resource to procure and to allow risk uh, manufacturing, et cetera. So the good news is 7 billion people now are covered by these countries coming together. Next slide. But so far we've received 1 billion doses. We still have 2 billion, 1 billion to go. And that's not enough, of course, to cover the rest of the world. This slide shows you the finance gap is still huge. Despite the raising $8 billion, you can see in the right corner, and particularly the third column, we still have $38 billion to fill, to close in vaccines, therapeutic, diagnostic, and health systems. And particularly if you look at where we are today, after all the fundraising, there's still a $28 billion gap. As you heard for vaccine, there's 1 billion for this year and 7 billion for next year to be able to reach 2 billion doses. Next slide. So I think the major issue I wanna talk about here ending is to say, we really need to raise money. And the problem right now is the donor assistant model. You head in hand, you go to people to pledge for money. And I do think we need a sustainable mechanism for the future that's reliable and, uh, and uh, predictable. We need to engage all countries to work together. This is called multilateralism from nationalism. And of course, the issue that Larry and us talk about globally, and Dr. Gupta, is to how to run our vaccines in many different countries. How do you have equitable distribution and public trust? These are substantial issues. And I guess we'll come back to the later panel. I'll talk about some of these issues in more details. Next slide. With regards to digital technology and data, I think you're well aware of the capabilities that you see over here, in particularly applying for contact tracing, surveillance, social distancing, but now tracking the vaccine, as you heard, in terms of distribution and safety. Next slide. I think that it is true, next slide, that there's got to be a privacy firewall. I'm sorry, the slide before that. But I think, however, in our country, as in many countries, uh, there is the lack of overarching strategy and coordination. So even as we roll out the digital technology, at least in surveillance tracking, it's state dependent. And there's no sustained financing model. So this article in Lancet calls for a high level of coordination strategies and financing in order for us to be effective altogether. Last slide. So my last slide simply says this is where we need it. We need a global coordinated end-to-end R&D preparedness response for vaccine therapy diagnostics. An egg accelerator has started this way, but it's only supposed to exist for two years. It's not really strongly governed and it's been really good, but what happens after COVID? We need a strategy and coordination of public health interventions and digital innovations. There's a lot of innovations entrepreneurism, you hear it in this whole meeting, but who is in fact pulling this together in our country and at the state level perhaps, and how do we coordinate and really apply it and collect the data that we need? We need multilateralism and we need sustainable financing. So I will speak a little bit more in the panel on some of these details. Suffice to say that we still have a long way to go despite the somewhat optimistic presentation of Anurada and Larry and others, I think the last mile is huge. Lots of information not known, but even the early miles of getting enough financing and sustainability is still there. What happens after COVID? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhao, for an, an excellent uh, presentation. 
and for really giving us a recipe for uh, how to move forward in terms of a roadmap for equity, for innovation, for collaboration uh, across our country and the world.